G'day fans, and we're back talking about Star Trek Discovery. It's the eighth, eighth, eighth episode now. Stuff's happening everywhere. It's very, very, very cool. It's Dags and MPS with you, and we're talking about the Sanctuary. woo doesn't that sound very exciting? So there you go. MPS, just quickly, old son, what did you think of the Sanctuary? I thought there were some pretty little things floating around that were very cute to see. It was like, what's that? It's a dead one of those. <laughs> well, there's no denying uh, that yeah. those locusts were far cuter than the ones we have on our planet. So, uh, yeah, you'd have those I, know. The week. I don't know why you'd call them locusts. They, they didn't look anything anyway. That's not that's that's for another discussion as to to weird creatures in the Star Trek universe. Uh, I think there were some very interesting bits, and uh, I think there were some spectacular lines delivered. Uh, but we will get into that shortly. Very good. So clearly there's like three stories for this entire episode. So let's just focus on the first one, which is at the very, very start with Giorgio, right? She's got a bit of a mental thing going on. She's not the happiest camper in the world and poor old Culber's trying to get through to her. And good to good on him for standing up to her too, instead of just taking her crap. Like, you know, she seems to boss everybody around. Um, I mean, it was pretty obvious what the issue is. The fact that we're not the actual problem, but she's clearly afraid to show any weakness because, you know, in her entire life, she's always been a strong person and she's got a bit of a, you know, a couple of screws loose up top. The last thing she wants to do is just spill her guts out to everybody. So you can clearly see that's what that's all about. So, uh, but as to what the actual issue is, uh, is anybody's guess. What do you reckon? Well, she did see in the scan later on that she said she was dying, but, you know, that's obviously not the issue when they were trying to figure out, you know, the other thing. When, what was interesting was they're in red alert and the doctor's wearing white, obviously, and he looks like he's all pink alert. So it just seemed sort of funny that how colours bounce off other things. Um, she also had a couple of really good lines. Um, like he said, oh, you might forget things like, where did you bury that last body? Yeah. You know, I thought that was very clever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then she said to, to him and to Michael, I should de- I could deconstruct you with a, with a snappy comment and a um, withering glance. <laughs> and then she goes, you know, I killed her, you know, talking about her mother, she goes, you know, I killed her. And then Michael goes, no, you didn't. So <laughs> there was some nice little dialogue between those three. Uh, yeah. And and there were some really good lines in that. And they were snappy and fast. And I think they were the more comedic moments in the show. Yeah. So uh, I guess the, of the other two particular stories, it was the final appearance, on-screen appearance of Osira. Oh, the big bad guy or bad girl for the for the season. You know, he looks like the Wicked Witch of the West with the green makeup and all the rest. And a few fans have pointed that out. Uh, and we get to see the nephew again. And like, he's, he's been given the how's your father. It's like, yeah, you just feed him off to the local uh, trans worm thing. Bob. So that's the end of that. So uh, good old Osira is now the big cheese with the old emerald chain coming along looking for a minute to lift him and looking for Rin, the old Andorian whose uh, antennas are finally starting to grow back. So uh, how'd you take all that? Well, it was interesting to see her finally because we've heard about her for a couple of episodes, but we haven't seen her. Uh, she obviously has a very powerful ring, that ring that she has when she touches and the nephew jumps up to the to where the trans, the trans worms, like you, you're in a trance. It was very hard to try and figure out terminology because there was like muffled, um dialogue for me um and then that when she mentioned that they put you in a trance and that's how you sort of see them and it was like really you got this giant thing and he's just gonna mesmerize you and he's talking he's going no i don't want to be eaten and then he gets eaten and gets ripped apart it wasn't like a yeah it's sort of very interesting wasn't it so you got the appearance of emerald chain okay you've heard about them in the past few episodes they finally appear and you see osira and all the rest of it and you go okay fair enough and of course, the biggest issue you've got is like, okay, this is the new bad girl or bad guy in town. And uh, of all the bad guys you've ever had in Star Trek, how does this one rate amongst all that? And you'd have to rate, it's so, so, so pretty weak. You know, they're sure they've got a big ship. Oh, that's fair enough. You've got a big ship. Everybody's got a big ship. That's the way it goes. But the green makeup doesn't just necessarily make you like, like threatening and, and evil. It's almost like um, if the Discovery crew had to ever watched ever any previous Star Trek episodes, when Osara appears on screen, they just laugh. They go, mate, we've had way far, far worse than you. We've had Klingons and Romulans and Borg and, you know, the Jem'Hadar. We've had a whole lot of bad, really bad asses out there. You don't cut the mustard. So 
I think they really need to sort of kick her a bit upstairs and do something a bit more uh, vicious with her. I mean, feeding her nephew to the to the monster thing is like, yeah, that's not that's not enough. You need to sort of really really stamp your presence. So, but anyway, we'll have to see how that all develops and uh, how it all goes along. So there you go. Did you notice, uh, just on a slight aside, like uh, they're, they're chasing Rin. They want Rin. Why do they want Rin? That's a very, why is he so, I actually, I asked that question halfway through the episode. Why, they, why is he so important? And at the end, in the episode, they actually ask, well, why you went so important? Because he knows they're running out of dilithium crystals. And it's like, but hang on, the whole universe is running out of dilithium crystals. That was established in the first episode of the show. It's like, that doesn't make a great deal of sense. It's like, it's no big secret. It's like, oh, dear, Fred, everybody's running out of dilithium crystals. Um, funnily enough, some Trek nerds apparently have sort of had a bit of a think about it and go, hang on. Dilithium doesn't actually run out. What happens is you just recrystallize it and it just keeps going, providing your ship doesn't blow up. So realistically, there should be plenty for everybody. So anyway, make of that what you will. Um, but in that scene when he first walks in and he's got uh, Tilly and Saru there and uh, Tilly puts him in his place, and Tilly, i got to say, has really, really ramped up her characterization in this episode. In real life, I don't know if people knew this or not, but the actor playing the Andorian is actually Mary Wiseman's husband. So there you go. So uh, they'll have a really good conversation after work that day. So you played an Andorian. I played the you know the first officer of the Discovery. How was your day today? <laughs> <laughs> he might, he, you, I could just see it now. He turns around, they get home. He goes, I've still got the blue makeup. She goes, I've still got the, the Terran Empire costume from <laughs> season two. So, you know, yeah. So, so it's not a big secret that that's no. the, the problem. So they're just going to be the same as everyone else. Yeah, I mean, I would have thought oh, they, she wants Rin because he kicked a cat or something like that. But no, 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 he, he knows something that nobody else knows. Well, we, everybody seems to know. But anyway, maybe he knows a bit more than what he just said. So there could be a bit more to the story there. Um, yeah. Did you like the fact, I mean, I, I mentioned Tilly a moment ago. Her, she is really taking a stamp of authority. Mm. And I think it works great. It looks good. It sounds good. Uh, and I like her moments with Saru. They're really starting to connect now. And I think we mentioned a couple of episodes ago that, her and him together now has left room for Stamets and Adira to connect. So they've, mm. they've pushed Tilly out of the picture, moved her up the stairs, as it were, and, and now Adira and Stamets are connecting. But I did like the idea, and I must admit, the writers must have a lot of fun with this when uh, Saru's trying to find his catchphrase, you know, oh, yeah. the old hit it type thing. And because when you watch it, you go, what are they talking about? Then you realize, oh, hang on, he's trying yeah. to find his word, his term. And, uh, you know, I think he said hit it was used by Pike. But he goes for it anyway. And I thought at some point he's going to say engage. You just know that's going to happen. But instead he said execute. So, uh, And I like how the whole crew turned around when he goes, you know, when he says execute or whatever. And they're like, wow. <laughs> it's very, very cute. So he's looking for yeah. his phrase. What do you reckon? I think they're going to struggle to find another decent word because we've used all the good ones, I think, yep. so far. So um, he may just go back to what he was saying originally. Uh, but... Maybe it's he could good find something from his time. It's good that they're spending time on these little things, you know, these little mm -hmm. details. And that's what like, really brings it out. You know, and the fact that Tilly actually says, you know, oh, Pike said, he's like, hit it. And all that. And it's just, it's like those really, really small things that make you engage with the characters rather than just being yeah. completely in the zone the whole time. Uh, and one of the things that really made this episode work was the fact that all the background characters got some screen time and some dialogue. And that was just fantastic because you see so little of them and there's so little development. I mean, Detmer is probably about the only one who's actually had some development because she's got a, you know, her PTSD thing going on there. And of course, in this episode, she gets ramped right up, you know, herbing around in Booker's ship, blowing the bejesus out of the, the Viridian. And it was really, really good to see at the end. You know, they're all like doing their, they're getting a bit of screen time. And uh, I reckon that was absolutely fantastic. So what do you think of all that? It's good to see that um, she's getting a bit of, of pilot time going on because... It, she's flying around autopilot, then she goes on to manual, which is a bit of a, a you know, um, video game-esque type of, of feel. But it feels a bit sort of Voyager because it feels like, you know, it's Tom Paris all over again. You know, he flies the Voyager, then he gets the shuttlecraft and he does this. And he, so if she starts doing that, we've, we've sort of gone back a little bit in terms of uh, uh, characterization. Well, some Star or most Star Trek fans that I've spoken to have actually said it reminds them of Star Wars with Poe Dameron and a Star Destroyer. So that was Star Trek fans saying that. So uh, even I thought at the time, it's like, oh, this is very Star Wars esque. And uh, yes, other Star Trek fans have picked up on that uh, very much uh, the same way. But that was actually a really, really good sequence with Detmer and with Ren. And I like the fact that J Grudge jumps on his lap and was like, oh, what is it? What is it? What is it? And of course, yeah, he wouldn't have seen a cat before. And that was a really, yeah. really cool moment, actually. And the fact that he didn't just go, oh, this is really cute and fluffy. What is it? Uh, you know, kind of give it a pat and a cuddle. And, of course, it's a big cat, too. So good old grudge makes him an appearance, and it's a damn good appearance this time. So, uh, yeah. Not just there. not just that, but he hangs on to it through the whole <laughs> flight. It's like, oh, my God, I can't – I've got to hold on to something, so I'm holding on to the cat. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, exactly right. All right. So the main thing is, uh, I know this is a really, really cool moment in this in the story. They're trying to work out the deal with the burn, right? They've got all the black box information. They've put all together this beautiful little graph and they're trying to work it out. And everything's starting to slowly come together, right? The origin of the burn, what the deal is with the damn music that seems to have sort of come and gone over the past few episodes and what's going on. And of course, at the heart of it all is a Federation starship. And all the fans straight away have said, it's the Discovery, right? It's either the Discovery or a version of the Enterprise. That's what it will be. It'll be one of those sort of temporal, like complete mind screws where there's two Discoveries now. And uh, what do you reckon about all that? What do you think the chances are? Oh, I haven't heard that theory, but uh, yeah, that could be interesting. The I don't know. There's some sort of discovery. There's some sort of Federation ship there. Who knows and what it is. And look, I wouldn't be surprised if it was something that we already knew, you know, if it was like, you know, Voyager B or something and yeah. someone else was on it or uh, I don't know. I don't, yep. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if they do a, a discovery 1.1 sort of thing sitting yep. in the yep. in there and they're sent the message knowing that they'll figure it out because they've yep. gone into the future. And yep. <clears throat> So what it'll be, right, it's meant to be a bit of a, and it'll be at the end of the uh, the cliffhangers um, episode where they, at the end of the season when they go, they find their ship and they have a look and go, oh my God, it's us. Yeah, roll credits. Um, <laughs> some nerds who really, really dial into this stuff have said it, it may be the episode Calypso from Short Tricks, which also involves the discovery in Zora. So some people are really dialed into that. So, yeah, make it that way you will, uh, which is kind of groovy. But uh, yeah, it would seem like it's going to be one of those two things. It's not going to be some random ship that's just appeared out of nowhere. So, yeah. uh, but we'll watch this space. But yeah, who would have thought, hey, the burn may have actually been caused by the discovery itself oh my god hell rev that's just like a mind that's just insane so uh very, what, if, very good what if what if here's a big what if what if it was the um uh, the mirror universe discovery and it was actually giorgio's like it was all them yeah and yeah and oh that, that actually could explain why Giorgio's having all these problems at the moment because she's you know in the wrong temporal timeline blah 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 yeah. blah, blah and uh you know insert insert trick no babble here uh yeah actually that would be an interesting one so uh yeah it's the uh the mirror universe of discovery so uh i think it was oh. an ISC, if i recall discovery so um yeah. yeah very very cool um a couple of little bits that i thought were kind of cool um the guns that they held on the planet i really yeah. like the style when you put the hand through the grip of that, that was that was very very groovy actually it was nice to see um, when uh, Michael's with the little kid at the end and they go, oh, you can go to Linus and peel off part of his face. <laughs> Jeez. This is now a bit of a recreational hobby for some people. Let's just go and peel off some Linus's face. <laughs> well, it's just like when you peel off sunburn, you know, but yeah. you're peeling it off someone else. So yeah. who knows? Yeah. I, I, like I like it when Philly pulls off a piece of um, Saru. Yep. Yep. And it's like, wow, he's, he's not just sh shredding. He's exploding almost because it's getting everywhere yeah exactly right and then we're back to the old i i no no it's just one eye line it's good that yeah. they, they do little subtle things like that in fact michael and booker are really connecting now and it's mm. their, their chemistry is really starting to show it is and it's good to see that their their relationship is is developing but yeah they're they're actually working together the the weird thing again he's running around the ship looking for her and he could have just no, said, no. you know he could have just Activated and said, Oh, where are you? And she would have said, oh, I'm here. And he would have said, oh, I'm here. I'll meet you there. And yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I know. So there are a few things that, that are sort of gelling in that sort of yes, sense. Yes, exactly right. Yes. You create your own solutions, which then invent their own problems. Exactly right. So there you go. Um, and uh, as we sort of mentioned earlier, so the Emerald Chain is now at war with the Federation. So Pearl Tilly's idea of saying, Oh, yeah, we've got a rogue pilot in a rogue ship. Yeah, that kind of backfired. And of course, in the next episode, clearly they've got to go back and tell Vance and go, uh, Yeah, you know, you told us just to go and observe. Uh, we kind of didn't. And <laughs> we've kind of pissed a few people off. So um, uh, I think it'll, uh, it'll take a bit for the Emerald Chain to sort of really show their their teeth and um and see what kind of a threat they really are but um um and there was actually just uh, one final thing for myself actually there was one little moment where uh it's the uh, character nielsen who's the blonde lady uh, on the bridge finally got to show that she really is sort of number one sort of exo quality in some of her dialogue and some of the way she thinks and uh and i think we discussed a couple of episodes ago that you know tilly got moved up to the first officer but you know, nielsen is probably the one who probably should have been mm. picked and i was thinking maybe the reason they didn't do that is because in the storyline the character just hadn't been developed at all it's just another person on the bridge so that's probably the reason um from a writer's point of view but in universe she seems to just just even a couple of words or a couple of lines it gives the impression like yeah you're pretty dialed into what's going on so yeah uh, watch this space i guess so there you go yeah. 
The other, the other thing I liked was when they, uh, Rin was talking about, um, I think it was Tatili, and he said uh, that um, Andorians were always afraid um, by the Federation and, and they would tell their kids if they were naughty, they'd go to, to Federation summer camp. It's like, <laughs> oh, that's kind of kind of cute. But we've seen from, from Enterprise that this is not the case whatsoever and this is, you know, a thousand years since Enterprise yep. almost that the Andorians and the Federation should have been friendly at least you know yeah. you would have thought that yeah. they would have figured it out sometime along the line very good stuff um all right so we need to rate the episode in uh federation logo so mps any final words before we rate the episode of the sanctuary what do you reckon oh look i think we've covered it all off uh mm. i'm curious to see where it all sort of goes we've only got a few more episodes left uh before the end of the season which is a shorter season than normal uh, and I'm curious to see where we go and if anything actually gets um, concluded at the end of, by the end of the season. Uh, look, for me, it was a pretty average sort of episode. Uh, the dialogue with, with Philip at the beginning and all that sort of boosted it up. So, oh, look, I think I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going to give it only three this week because, you know, it was not that great. It was sort of predictable. It was, it was, it was, it was a three from me. Wow. How about that, eh? Uh, for myself, I'm going to say the the character moments were the clearly the strongest elements by far, especially at the end when they're all sitting around the table and all the all the background characters are finally getting their moment to shine and Detmer gets to shine and all the rest. But it's absolutely fantastic. The only problem I found that is that uh, Syrah is not really a credible sort of villain at this stage. Um, you know, it's just like with all the villains we've had in Star Trek, kind of just not cutting the mustard. So sort of needs to step up a bit. You know, get someone like the Dominion on board. That's what you call real high class villains. Um, and also found that the uh, whole thing on the planet was a little bit predictable, you know, okay, oh my God, we're going to save the day quickly. Get to our, let's get our heads together, literally. And uh, as it turns out, you know, it's all well and good. The locusts are gone and yeah, it's all very, very fantastic. So, um, but despite these elements of predictability, um, I find that the the strongest parts are still is what's selling the show is what making it work. And I'm really dialing into that. So for that reason, uh, I've decided to go for four. Um, Federation logos because I thought, you know, I really quite enjoyed it and I'm finding I'm, I'm engaging huh? uh, with the actual um, episodes in, in a big way, which is very, very cool. Speaking of episodes, we're actually going to be back in a few days' time for the next one. Oh, my God, it's very, very exciting stuff heading towards the end of the season. Yay, team! Oh, my goodness. So we can't loiter around any longer. We've got to get going and uh, we'll see you then. So in the interim, make sure you keep on trekking. So bye for now. Okay.